Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to convene this daily conversation around all things dealing with COVID-19. We cover three major crises, the health crisis, the financial crisis, the racial inequality crisis. And we're always looking for your suggestions and theme ideas. Give us names of speakers, nominate yourself. Sri at Sri.net is my email address. Today, we're talking about the ADA and the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. We will talk about the impact that legislation has had on America and beyond. We have six incredible guests with us, and you will meet them in a few minutes. We have with us Anna Pacman. She's at Annotated. She's a filmmaker. Liz Pritchard at Paperbag underscore comic, comic book artist, painter, and teacher. Anastasia Somoza, international disability rights activist, sp advocate, speaker, and consultant. Sean Horn is with us beauty and disability advocate and Forbes columnist. DRC Charrington Neal is with us, advocate and PhD student. And Amy Padnani is with us. She edited the incredible New York Times special report on the ADA anniversary. And she will talk to us about that. I have the physical copy of that section with us here today. In the meantime, please tell us where you're watching from. Please share this with friends and family around the world. Tag them on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. We're live now, and they can see the recording as soon as we're done. Please share this with as many people as you possibly can, and please say hello to us as well. We're so grateful that you're with us. Hi, everybody. I'm Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to be here with all of you. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm also the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting business. We say don't, don't postpone your physical event and don't make it a virtual event without talking to us. We can help you for an event of 25 people or 100,000 people. Yep, we did an event for the largest gathering of teachers in history, the T4 conference, and we had 100,000 people from 88 countries join us. So please write to me, sri at sri.net. We'd love to talk to you and geek out about all things virtual events, social and digital consulting. Thank you so much for being here. We're live right now on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. And I'm so delighted to be with you today as we tackle this very important topic of the ADA 30th anniversary. We didn't want to let the month pass without talking about it as this is the anniversary month. This is the special issue that we were talking about. 30 years since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Beyond the Law's Promise is the topic, is the, is the title, and so many great articles in here. And we will be meeting the editor who put that together. So please stay tuned. Please tag your friends. We want everybody to join us from around the world so they can learn about this. Before we start, since many of you are new to us, let's remind you, this show is in its 141st straight day. No holidays, no vacations, no weekends. We've been live every single day. We've had more than a million viewers, more than 88 million social impressions, more than 234 guests, 143 of them have been women, and we gotta up that ratio even more. We've had guests from 48 cities, 13 countries, doctors, nurses, authors, journalists, CEOs, founders, teachers, professors, and so many more. We are only able to do this because of our incredible producers, Rose Horowitz, at Rose Horowitz 31, and Vandana underscore Menon. They'll both be annotating and posting and tweeting. Please follow them. When they signed up for this, they had no idea what was about to happen. And thanks to all of you, we're here. This is also brought to you by scroll.in, which is more than 2 million followers on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. They are one of India's leading news, culture, and information websites. And we're so grateful to them for their time with us and letting us produce this with them. 
We also want to thank our sponsors, Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media, a free certification course now available, mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. Please share this so that your friends can see this. More than 4,000 people have already taken this course, and you should too. I learned a lot putting it together. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter lessons for everybody. We also want to tell you about another fabulous show that we help produce, She's On Call. And this runs every single Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And this past Sunday, they had a special back to school episode. Dr. Heather Kloss was with us, infectious diseases expert at Temple University. Dr. Sally Goza, president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And Donna Mazik, registered nurse, executive director of the National Association of School Nurses. Please go back and watch this episode at She's On Call. My two favorite surgeon physician friends, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Kurian, host this show. And I'm honored to be a co executive producer. Please check them out. A couple more sponsors, and we're done. We want to tell you about Nun Believable. Divinely delicious cookies on a mission. Each box of handcrafted cookies provides two meals to those in need. 20% off with the code SREE, S-R-E-E, S-R-E-E, -E -E, at nunbelievable.com. Divinely delicious cookies on a mission. And one last plug to tell you about another show that we do every Sunday, and it's called the New York Times Read Along. We read the New York Times out loud at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. We've been doing it for five years, sort of like crazy people. And this past Sunday, we were reading with Anthony De Palma, 22-year New York Times reporter, foreign correspondent, expert on Latin America, Mexico, and Cuba. And while we were reading the episode, we were reading the New York Times with him, we came across this issue, and we knew we had to cover this and do it soon. So that's how that happened. Please check us out 8.30 a.m. Eastern time every Sunday. All right, are you ready to meet our fabulous guests? I'm giving them a heads up because they've been busy forwarding and connecting and tagging and sharing with their friends. And we're gonna bring them on. Because there are so many guests, we're gonna have three of them on first and then another three in the second half of the show. But I'm gonna bring them all on at the beginning just to say hello so that they can be with us and you'll see everyone who is joining us. So our guests are Anna Packman, filmmaker, Liz Pritchard, uh, comic book artist, painter, and teacher. And we're also joined by Natasha Anastasia Somoza, who is an international disability rights advocate, Sean Horn, who is a beauty and disability advocate, and Darcy Dar Charrington Neal, who is an advocate and PhD student, and Amy Padnani, who edited that special report. Amy, Anna, and Liz will stay for the first half, and DRC, Sean, and Anastasia will join us for the second half. But everybody is here right now, and it's my pleasure to bring them all on stage at the same time. If someone of them has muted themselves, we'll ask them to unmute so they can say hi. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks you for, for being us. here. Thank you for being here. Uh, first question I always ask our guests is, how are you? Where are you? So we'll ask our guests who are stepping away for a little bit to go first. We're going to ask uh, Shyam, Diarthi, and uh, Anastasia to say hello first, and then we will bring them back. Anastasia, where are you? How are you doing through this crisis? I am very well. Thank you for having me on. It's my honor and pleasure to join this terrific panel. And thank you for all your work. I'm joining from uh, New York, from Catskill, New York, to be exact. And I am doing my best to manage uh, this upside down world we're living in. That's all we can ask. Thank you, and we'll see you in a few minutes, in about 30 minutes. Okay, let's go now to DRC. Hi, DRC. How are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing all right. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Uh, I am currently in Florida in the Petri dish of foolishness, so I'm trying very hard to stay safe, um, but it is an honor to be here. 
And we are so grateful that you're with us. Please be safe. Those of us in New York, everyone was looking at us and now we're looking at you, Florida. <laughs> at true. You. See, you gotta hope, keep everybody safe out there. It's true. All right, let's now go to Sean. Hello. How are you? Sean, can you hear me? Sorry, we we might be having a little bit of trouble with the mute button here. Let's see one second. Sorry about that. Um, I think her, let's see, we'll, we'll come back to Sean, but uh, very nice to have her here. She is a beauty and disabilities advocate and a columnist for Forbes uh, and uh, is, is uh, very prolific in the work that she does. She's gonna join us back in just a second, I'm sure. Uh, let me ask our other three guests how they're doing and then we'll keep them for the conversation. So let's go to Amy, tell us how you are and how you're doing. Yeah, I'm doing as well as can be. I'm happy to be here talking to you guys, especially after working so hard on this section and everything that I've learned. Uh, I'm in New York City and Washington Heights. Okay, thank you. And we'll be talking about your section. And let's go to Liz Pritchard. Hi, everyone. I'm in Rochester, New York. And yes, the pandemic's been extremely challenging, but also it's also helped me um, shift my creativity and push myself even further to expand my network, not even virtually, but also I've been creating a lot more because of it and just growing even more as an artist and a person. Well, that is very special. Me. Yeah, and we're, we're delighted to have you here. And now I'm gonna ask Anna that question. Hi, thanks so much for having me on. Um, so I am New York City, um, I'm in Hell's Kitchen and um, I would say I've been very busy um, and, you know, learning new things, trying new things. Um, I think there's definitely been that silver lining. And uh, learning new things, any sourdough bread baking in your, in uh, your time? My, my mom is, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Well, God bless moms. Okay, so we're going to say goodbye for just a little while to DRC and Anastasia, and then we'll bring them back in about uh, 25 minutes or so. So thank you very much, DRC. Save the Florida folks while we're, we're, we're you're out there. Thank you. We'll and, uh, and we'll bring you right back. And thank you, Anastasia. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Um, so let's go now to our speakers who are here. Uh, I know that Anna would like to tell us about an incredible film uh, that she made uh, that involved Liz. So let's start with that. And then we'll talk about the special section of the New York Times that we hope everybody was able to see. It's online and available, of course, and uh, it is about the ADA and the 30th anniversary. So much to read. We could have done just a read aloud of this, and that would have been the entire episode. So, Amy, I want to hear all about that. But, Anna, let's talk first about the film you made. Yeah, so first of all, I'm so happy I'm going first because I would not want to follow the New York Times. Amy, that was an absolutely incredible uh, initiative that you guys did, so thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so Liz and I made a film uh, for a, a competition called the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. And what that is, it's a film challenge for people with and without disabilities. Um, and you're basically given five days to make a movie. Uh, and you're given an assignment, which this year was a documentary. And you basically you have to do it all yourself. You can't um, pay any of your crew. It's all volunteer based. Uh, so super low budget. Um, I think our budget for this was about $15. Um, and we made this over the course of three days actually. And um, the film, um, and you know, hopefully you guys will get to see it in a few seconds, follows uh, Liz's story. So Liz is an incredible artist I met through Lights Camera Access, which is a mentoring workshop series that happens all across the country that I've been very fortunate to be part of over the last um, few years um, as a mentor um, and as a facilitator of some of the workshops. Um, and I met Liz in New York City when she was my mentee, and I was absolutely blown away by her art and her talent. Um, and so when this opportunity came up, and I'm actually a first time filmmaker, so speaking about learning new things and doing new things during the pandemic, um, I've done video production for work, but never for myself. So um, teamed up with Liz, and as soon as we found out that the challenge was to tell your story, 
um, I realized two things. One, that if um, I made a film about my own story, no one would want to watch it. It would be very boring. Um, and two, that this was an incredible opportunity to showcase Liz's talent um, and her art and just her positive spirit, which I think is so necessary in this time when all you hear is bad news. Thank you for uh, telling us about this. Uh, why don't we tell each of your stories a little bit, uh, both Liz and Anna, and then we'll play a section of the film. Shall we do that? So Anna, you want to tell us your story, and then we'll go to Liz for her story. Oh, gosh. So, so you really want to bore everyone. <laughs> okay. No, <not> bore. <laughs> sure. Um, so I, you know, I have several pulse you can't tell just from looking at this and um, I use a mobility scooter to get around, which is kind of like a wheelchair. Um, usually you see grandparents in the commercials for them, but um, I am not a grandparent. And um, so I grew up in New York City. I'm a New Yorker through and through. Um, originally came to this country from Russia. Um, been here since I was four. And um, got involved in um, disability advocacy from a very early age because early on, um, watching a lot of TV, as one does, uh, I realized that so many people were on TV, but for some reason, none of them looked like me, except for some random girl in a wheelchair who wasn't really even in a wheelchair and saved by the bell. Um, and, you know, that's such a huge issue in the industry today, today to this point. Um, and, you know, the ADA anniversary, it's number 30. The ADA came into law um, when I was six years old. Um, and there's a lot that's changed and there's a lot I'm thankful for. But in terms of representation in the media, that has not changed um, as fast as it should. Um, today, the Ruderman Foundation um, did a study a few years ago and about 2% of all roles on network TV are characters with disabilities. And out of that number, only 5% are authentically cast, meaning they're actually played by actors with disabilities. And um, I was a finance maker, so I did the math. Um, that's 0.1% of all the people that you see on TV actually have a disability and are played by someone with a disability. And there are so many incredible people that I know, such incredible talent in the industry, where there really is no excuse not to cast an actor because the talent is out there. And one of the reasons why I wanted to get involved with Easter Seals um, is because of their mission to promote the talent of people with disabilities, both in front of and behind the camera. Um, and, you know, this, this, this is a side project for me. This is a passion project. Um, if you, you know, want to see what I do during the day, you can go see my LinkedIn, look me up. Um, but yeah, I spent, you know, um, I actually met Sri, I think you and I met when I was at Columbia, I went to Columbia Business School. Um, and then from there, I worked in the TV industry for um, a number of years. I started at NBC Universal and social media for the Oxygen Network, went to, uh, current TV, which was more on the news side, which transitioned into Al Jazeera America. So that's my personal media background. Um, and I don't bake sourdough. I'm not a baker, but I do love to cook. So that's um, one of the things I love to do and have loved doing during the pandemic. And I also used to travel when that was a thing beyond my own apartment. Yes, we're all learning that. And we yeah. also seen your they can go to Twitter, and I love your Twitter handle, annotated, A-N-N-A-tated. So I like that. Let's go to Liz for her story, and then we're going to watch a little bit of the film. The film also has Liz's story, but we want to hear it from her. Liz, go ahead, please. All right. So I'm a 26-year-old autistic comic book artist, and I also have several mental health conditions. But you see, I channeled um, the pain and my challenges into a creative, healthy outlet that enabled me to connect with others, and that was through my art which led to my advocacy in my original comic book series. Um, so I wasn't diagnosed with autism until I was about 15 years old. And I switched schools multiple times due to being bullied by, by teachers and staff and students. And by the fourth school I got to, I had this idea. I was in 10th grade at the time. And I said, what if I draw a comic about what's like, you know, being autistic? And I showed it to, you know, my teachers and students and in fact this was a huge risk not going to downplay it, really huge risk and in fact they actually understood me more so i found this vehicle to connect and express in a healthy way and i learned a lot about myself in the process 
by drawing from my experience and my pain and my struggles and changing it into something that can help myself and help others too. What really initiated my advocacy, however, was um, cause like Anna said, it's hard to find people who are like us. Uh, like, um, well, I came across Samantha Kraft's blog one day after I was diagnosed. She's a huge advocate of everyday Asperger's. She's also on the spectrum. She's a mother and she's an amazing writer and artist too. And I thought, um, why I can do this too. I can make advocacy in my own way. So that's why I turned to comic books and it's called Paper Bag. It's about how love erases the masks we hide behind. How, you know, it's just not focusing on the labels because we're all human and everyone deserves a chance. Okay, so let, thank you. Uh, let's thank you. take a look and you're at paperbag underscore comic. So yes. you can find you there. And yep. I'm now gonna play the video. Do you wanna just set this up what we're gonna see right at the top? Liz or Anna, maybe Liz, you wanna just tell us what, what what's gonna happen right at the beginning? Sure, so it's, uh, it's gonna start in black and white and go into color eventually. The black and white portion, I'm just talking about my past experiences how I discovered myself through my art and, and how I overcame these challenges. Later on, when I find my calling in teaching, because I became a teacher too, I'm an art instructor and just how helping myself to help others and how we can all connect and share and learn from each other. And how I got into video editing. Uh, video editing was huge, especially in the pandemic. And then I connected with Anna, I connected with Lights, Camera, Access more. We did the ADA 30 presentation for ADA 30 lead on, we had this whole team, we got the whole event streamed, it's on Facebook, so I'll make sure to send that over too, but yeah. Thank you. So Thank we're gonna play this now. Everybody watching, please share this. We are in the middle of a terrific conversation with advocates and filmmakers and others who care about the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's the 30th anniversary, and right now we're gonna watch about two minutes of this film, and then we're gonna come back, talk about it, and bring on Amy, uh, uh, who is gonna talk about the special New York Times section that ran this Sunday. It's online, of course, but this is the print section that we have here. It's called Beyond the Law's Promise. So here we go. We're gonna play this video right now. Hi, everyone. My name's Liz Pritchard. I am a autistic comic book artist and advocate who illustrates inclusion for all kinds of minds. Um, I was born in Rochester, New York, and as a kid, I was often very, very misunderstood. And uh, yeah, I was diagnosed autistic at age 15, including but not limited to another variety of labels, paranoid schizophrenia being one of them. I had to switch schools multiple times due to being bullied. And by the fourth school I went to, it's about 10th grade, and I had this revelation one day, what if I draw what it's like being a girl who's autistic? And you know what, after I got the whole body of work done, it was about 36 pages by the time I finished, and I showed it to them, and, and in fact, they were they really liked it. And the reaction gave me the confidence to keep pursuing my creativity, and now I use my, my power of creativity and my artistic abilities to help others too. Doing art is a huge release for me. It helps me build bridges and connect with others in all different ways that I never thought were possible. And it changed how I see myself. Because when you start to draw a lot and you notice patterns over time, um, you'll notice things about yourself you never knew existed. Like, for example, I drew a cage 20 different ways. It took me until the 21st time I drew it. Okay, maybe there's a pattern here. I'm also a teacher at a creative arts center, Spectrum Creative Arts. And uh, yeah, it's a creative arts center for all ages and abilities, very inclusive. And we do one on one sessions, group classes, cool art based activities. So it's all about the connections. Art and advocacy has taken me to Taipei, Taiwan, Manila, Philippines, Tijuana, Mexico, and Vancouver, BC, Canada. Um, I have a lot more places I'd like to go on my bucket list, but it took me a very long time to get to the point I'm at now, confidence-wise especially. I used to be very scared to leave my car, let alone my, my house, when I was younger. But I had this revelation in 2017 when I got involved with ANCA, the Autistic Network for Community Achievement. I just had this revelation that you can keep staying in this front and you know going through the flow and motions, letting your anxiety rule you, or you can do something about it, learn about yourself and connect with others. Wow. So we're going to pause there. I know everybody would like to see the whole thing, but you can find it very easily online. 
Um, I'm going to ask Amy to just reflect on what she just saw and congratulate Liz and Anna. Liz edited the film and Anna and Liz co collaborated on it. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Amy, let me say hello to you and uh, ask you to reflect on what you saw and what you learned putting this incredible issue together. I don't even know what I'm holding it up, but go ahead, please, Amy. Yeah, I had so many thoughts, so I'm actually glad you asked. Um, Liz, your story is amazing, and I love the way you just found great empowerment in everything that you're struggling with. That's just uh, extremely inspiring. And Anna, what a brilliant idea to record it all um, in a film. Um, you know, I was thinking a bit about that, as well as the fact that there is so much creativity in the disability community, and it's hard to, it was hard with this section to capture all of that. There were a couple of ways we did, but um, I want to know more. I just would love to explore and understand the expression of uh, the disability community. I learned about things like alt text poetry, about music and sign language. There's just so many different forms of expression. So um, actually, there are additional pieces that didn't make it into the print section, including one that is 28 ways to absorb the art of the dis disability community. And um, those can be find, found on nytimes.com slash 8830. As for the print section, I see you're holding it there. And I would love to talk a little bit about, speaking of art, the, the cover art and some of the illustrations that we had. Um, this is a really nice idea by our designer, Tala Safi. She talked about how she looked at all of the, the the signs and posters from protests. You know, activists had fought for decades, centuries, centuries even, for disability rights. And one thing that really struck her was the signage and the handwritten quality and creativity of some of the signs. And so it went back to this idea of how grassroots it is, how resourceful people have been in fighting for their rights. And she wanted to capture that handwritten quality with the art. And so we hired an illustrator in England who has a physical disability and thinks a lot about this. And that art, she played a lot with the negative and positive space to, um, to sort of represent people coming out of the shadows about disability. So I thought it was really beautifully thought, well thought out and, um, and done. It does look a bit abstract, but when you dig deep, you get the feeling of what's really going on there. So uh, several Haley of them- Wall, right? That's her, that's her name, Haley Wall? Yes, that's right. That was the illustrator and uh, she does beautiful work. Uh, so the section itself has like two dozen essays and articles looking at a number of things. Representation is one of them. In fact, I talked to Jay Ruderman of the Ruderman Foundation over the phone and he was extremely helpful. We had several actors and a musician talk about how they feel are represented in the entertainment industry. One of them was Marley Matlin, probably the most famous deaf actress out there. Um, Ali Stroker, who was the first person, first actress with a disability to win a Tony uh, in 2019, which is amazing. Micah Fowler from The Star of Speechless, Lauren Potter from Glee, and Leroy Moore from Crip Hop Nation. He started that group to gain representation for hip hop artists with disabilities. And all of them talked about how they don't feel they're appropriately represented in the industry at all. They each had their own journey of fighting really hard to be represented and to get to where they are today. And they still don't feel like they have as many opportunities as they should. Even Marley Matlin with an Oscar gets turned down for roles because she's deaf, which is really crazy to think about in this day that we're living in. Um, there needs to be more inclusivity in, in shows and movies for sure. And the more you see all kinds of people, the more you embrace them and understand them. And that was what I heard again and again, working on this section. So it w that was probably one of the most meaningful pieces, but there's uh, at least a dozen more. <laughs> um, and I could go on if you'd like me to, but- um, I just wanted to read Marley, Mar uh, um, Marley Matlin's uh, sentence that she said at the very end, on this 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, we must reaffirm the fight for inclusion and I hope that sentiment is true for everyone, not just the millions of us who are deaf or disabled. And uh, this, you also did some things with the type, right? You made the type bigger in some places. That's what I, I heard, is that correct? 
We did, but most of the accessibility functions are online. We did also um, work with a vendor to have the entire section available in print braille, as well as in digital braille, which you can find online. And uh, we worked with, um, with our tech side to code in something called alt text, which is like descriptions of images that's picked up by digital screen readers for people who cannot see the images. Uh, so there are a number of things that we did online focusing on contrast and, and font size to make the section as accessible as we could. So- And you black and white on purpose as well, right? The black and white is easier to read, correct? It was, and it also just felt more in the spirit of what we were trying to do. We called it Beyond the Law's Promise because there, even though the ADA was a landmark law that achieves so much, there's still a lot of things that it doesn't include or cover. Um, technology, for instance, just gets flashier and flashier and less and less accessible. And uh, there are so many ways that it could just be solved really simply, actually. There are ways that many, many companies can make technology more accessible. And that is something that's not quite covered in the ADA, which was passed in 1990. And our reliance on tech has changed so much since then. So. Uh Sure, Thef. thank you, Amy. Can you just for, because we have a global audience, we should have done this at the very top, just explain the the, the role of the ADA, the, uh, the act itself, and the fact that it was signed by a Republican president. I have a feeling like today, anything like that, that would be considered such a big government intervention would not pass muster. Yeah, so uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed on July 26, 1990, and it basically was intended to eliminate discrimination of people with disabilities in employment, in um, transportation, in you know, so many other ways. Um, it's supposed to just break down the barriers uh, that separate people, that had separated people with disabilities from from accessing or just having a normal life. And when George H.W. Bush signed it, it was, it was an incredible moment and he gave um, this really powerful speech, I think, about exactly that, about breaking down walls and, um, and no longer tolerating discrimination. So um, I can't really speak more to the Republican versus Democrat side. I don't know what it would be like today in a debate, to be honest. Um, I think there's still a lot that people with disabilities are fighting for constantly, and it comes up again and again through every administration. Thank you. And I'm going to ask Anna to respond to everything she we just talked about and also remind us how to find it. But before that, I wanted to show Amy and everybody a story I wrote in the New York Times on December 2nd, 1996. So a lifetime ago, blind users add access on the web, turning graphics into spoken text. I was very proud of this article back in the day. And uh, I learned so much reporting that story uh, in the business section. It ran because on the New York Times wire in those days, it ran all over the country, even overseas. And one of the things that they told us is watch out as text and graphics and photographs and video all come online, it's going to be a problem. And we have certainly seen that be an issue uh, even back in 96, they were warning us about that advocate. So a shout out to all the advocates who make it possible to fight for the rights of folks with disabilities. That story is easily accessible. If you just search my name, Srinivasan in the New York Times for blindness, you will find that story. Let's go to Anna for her thoughts. Yeah, well, first of all, Amy, thank you so much for the kind words in the film. Um, anyone who wants to watch the full film, um, you can find it on Facebook, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it on Instagram Live. It's called My Superpower. It's on the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge um, Contest. And you could also go to bit.ly slash superpowerfilm. Um, so we made it super easy. Let me just say it one more time. Um, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash superpower, superpowerfilm. I said super flower film, that's another film, but uh, super power film sounds pretty good. bit.ly slash super power film. I'm sure our producers will tweet it and also put it into the, our Facebook so you can find it. Go ahead, Anna, please. Yeah, so super flower film, that's good. <laughs> um, not yet, not yet. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, I read, I think pretty much every article in the New York Times series, I think it's so incredible and you know, in my day job, so I'm a digital executive and, um, you know, I think, you know, 
I kind of embody, you know, the idea of like having a seat at the table is so powerful and so important in many different roles because now that I'm in a position in my career where I'm actually a decision maker, I don't sign a single contract for anything that I do that doesn't have accessibility as part of it and really hold vendors to task when it comes to making sure things like websites are accessible uh, and even making sure that we're adding alt text into um, things like Instagram posts and Facebook posts. And I saw Twitter just added that feature actually. So, you know, I'm gonna start that as well. Um, you know, just making sure that everyone is included and we're not creating obstacles. Um, and the other thing that I will say is just like, you know, a ramp helps me get in a building. Um, a ramp helps a mother with a stroller um, as well. A ramp helps, um, you know, delivery people who are pushing carts, elevators, help many more people than just people with disabilities. And like closed captioning, you know, we're all used to seeing those videos on Facebook, scrolling through our feeds, uh, and we're used to seeing them on YouTube. And the benefit of that for everyone, and the benefit of that to marketers, um, to you know, I challenge all you know marketers and business people you have the power to do it just just do it just just make it a requirement make it one of your things that like you just don't the site doesn't get launched until it's accessible your content doesn't get launched until you have closed captioning um and you're going to benefit in so many ways because you get rewarded by google you get rewarded by facebook by their algorithms because they can read that text that you have in captions for example a video and when people are searching, they're searching with words. They're not searching with voice yet. I'm sure that's coming soon. Um, but from a business perspective, there's so many benefits to doing it um, and many more than you know to just not doing it. Great, thank you. Liz, before we let you go, we'd love to hear your thoughts on what you've seen and heard so far. And also, uh, what are you working on and how do people find out more about you and your comic book, of course, paper bag, underscore comic is your Twitter handle. Anna is Anna Pacman on Twitter. And Amy is at Amy NYT. And by the way, we didn't discuss Amy's real title and job at the New York Times. We're going to come to that before we let her go. We're going to talk about her uh, her, her work uh, some more before we let her go. So go ahead, Liz. And then we're going to bring our other guests back on and we'll let these folks get back to their evening. So Liz, go ahead, please. All right. Well, to answer the question, you can find my, my work also on Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, type in paper bag comic. And then on Instagram, Liz underscore paper bag underscore comic. And my current projects that I'm working on uh, is just more video editing, learning more and expanding my craft and trying new things. That's really what saved me is pushing myself out of my comfort zone. And I want anyone to know that no matter what label or what identity you have, pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is the best advice I've given myself. So I'm passing it on to you. It's a, yeah, it's terrifying and it's uncomfortable, but it's necessary for growth. And I'm just doing virtual art sessions one-on-one -on -one right now because of the pandemic. We aren't doing in-person classes at my creative arts center. So I teach with my students. We go through awesome art activities on Zoom. And yeah, I'm just really grateful that I was able to share my story with you all tonight. So thank you very much. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Nice. And paperbag underscore comic on Twitter. I yeah. made a mistake, even though I got it right earlier. I made a mistake. It's Anna. Uh, annotated on Twitter as Anna Pacman. Turns out Anna Pacman is her cousin. So there are two cousins and Anna Pacman. That would be confusing. Uh, let's let's ask Amy to talk a little bit about her job that she was doing at the Times before she got moved on to this big, big report that she had to do. She is the obituaries editor of the New York Times. And uh, I love, you know, this is sometimes sounds macabre, but I love reading the obituaries. I'm sure you hear this all the time, Amy. I love reading them. It's in fact, one of the first things I read and I'm obsessed with them a little bit, but I'll try not to scare you by how obsessed I am. Tell us about doing that. And also I, I have to salute you for the overlooked section of obits that you supervised, you created that have had such an impact folks. For those of you who haven't noticed, the New York Times has been running a series of obits on women, people of color, and others who didn't, when they should have had an obit back in the day, did not. And it could have been years ago or decades ago. I think at least one was more than a century ago. And uh, we really salute you for doing those. 
uh, Amy, and tell us about that work, and then we'll let you go. Sure. So yeah, I, my day job is on obituaries, which is kind of strange that I ended up on the ADA project. But it, in actuality, it makes sense because of my work on Overlooked, which is there to represent underrepresented voices. And a colleague reached out to me. He runs a column on opinion called Disability, which is uh, essays written by people with disabilities. And he said, you know, among the overlooked, people with disabilities are perhaps the most overlooked. And that really stuck with me. Um, so this project, as you described, it seeks to sort of correct the balance of history and fill in the gaps for people who are left out, largely women and people of color, people with disabilities. Uh, it really just runs the gamut. Um, and so you can see some of the recent ones we have there. Nancy Green, who is the model for Aunt Jemima, the character was of course just retired in June. Uh, Brad Lomax, a disability civil rights uh, movement activist. And uh, many, many others. Um, Valerie Solanas, who's known for uh, shooting Andy Warhol. Uh, she was also a radical feminist. So many big figures. Sylvia Plath never got an obit, we learned. Um, How Alan is that Turner. possible? One second. How is that Sylvia Plath not getting a Oh, but so that was kind of the male centric world, I presume, right? That was part of it for sure. Yeah. When uh, I remember we mentioned her husband, but we didn't mention her. Um, I mean, her husband was very well known, Ted Hughes, but but yeah, she didn't get an obit oddly. And Ida B. Wells, the pioneering journalist, we mentioned her wedding announcement but we never mentioned her death, oddly enough. So so that's the Overlook Project. Um, and that's how I got into the ADA project too. Well, thank you for that work. And if I if I can, I'm gonna show everyone one of my favorite overlooked obits that you ran. It's about the queen, uh, India's warrior queen, Rani of Jhansi, the queen of, of Jhansi, uh, who uh, trained and led her own army and was killed in battle, who fought the British and was a real hero. And she died. Let's look at the the dates just to uh, let me see if I can easily find the dates. You you start in 1851 when the uh, when uh, Times began April. publishing. Right. So I'm trying to find where where uh, she died in 1858. So is this the oldest or one of the oldest that you have done? I it's definitely one of the oldest. Yeah, we've only had a couple in the 1850s. So yeah. she was a remarkable one. And there's a movie about her too. There was. Uh, everyone, NYT Amy, thank you so much for being here. We're very grateful to you. We hope uh, you'll come back and talk more another time about Obit so I can geek out on those. Uh, but thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> Liz, thank you. thank you for being here. Pa at underscore, under, uh, at paperback underscore comic. Thank you. And Anna, and Anna Pagman, she's at annotated on Twitter. We're now going to bring back our other guests. Thank you, folks. We'll see you. Bye bye, and you can be in the comments on Facebook and uh, and you know comment and post things. We'd love that. Thank you very much. Let's take you off and say uh, thank you to all of you. All right, now we're ready for our other other guests. I'm just going to once again bring everybody up under the screen here. We're going to be joined by Sean Horn, who is with us, and DRC Charrington Neal, who is with us, and we are joined by Anastasia Somoza, who is with us as well. They're all here. Please welcome all of them as they say hello to all of you. Hello. Hi. 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 How are you? Uh, I, I think Sean is having a little bit of trouble with her, uh, uh, with her internet access, but we will bring her back for sure. Let's talk to Anastasia first. Anastasia, say, uh, tell us, reflect please if you can on the conversation we just had. Um, it was, I, it was an honor to listen to, um, uh, Anna, in in particular, has been a lifelong friend of, of mine. We've actually known each other since we were four years old. We grew up together. Um, so I, uh, I'm so grateful for all of the people with disabilities and all of um, those of people who are not disabled but are allies for supporting us in, in doing this work. So I... Um, agree with literally everything that was said by the previous panelists, and I'm proud to know them and call them allies. Thank you, Anastasia, and we'll hear your story in just a minute. Let's go to DRC and uh, say hello. Hi, DRC. Hello. Your reflections, your reflections please. Uh, yeah, um, you know, that was a, a really, really great 
conversation, you know, it was funny because um, what, um, I can't remember the exact person. Um, I know it, it wasn't Anna, but the uh, the the woman who, who does the obituaries. Yeah, uh, Amy. Amy. Um, Amy, yes, I'm sorry, Amy. Um, you know, when she was talking about the different features that were in the New York Times piece, it struck me how every single person that she mentioned, uh, with the exception of Leroy Moore, um, is white. And so I know Leroy. And so I just thought it was funny because, you know, that is the reflection of disability in the United States through media um, that most people, because of, um, even though we've had amazing strides in the last 30 years, that I think the, the other side that we're now having to boomerang and come back around on is that, yeah, you see people with disabilities now, but they're all white. Uh, and so I, I just thought it was interesting how, you know, we, I, myself as a black person who also has cerebral palsy, it's like, I have to do so much more work to convince people that, you know, the cultural competence that I have as a black man is just as good and just as valid as anyone who doesn't have a disability on top of being black. Um, so I just thought it was really poignant you know, when she was talking about, you know, how other people are trying really hard, uh, Marley Matlin, to get work, even though she has an Oscar, you know, I still think it's interesting because there's still a level of white privilege that exists. Um, and I just thought it was fascinating. Thank you. And folks, uh, the RC is at Dr. Carrington. His first, his, his middle, uh, his uh, name, Carrington, is without the I, but your Twitter handle has that I in there, right? Char yeah. I use a wheelchair, so I, I thought I was being clever. And you are, and I noticed <laughs> that. It's very, it is very clever. So Dr. Charrington, and you're a PhD student. When do we get the PhD? <laughs> I mean, I am currently working on my dissertation, so it's going to be another couple of years, but I am working on that. <laughs> in in the world of PhDs, there's something you call ABD, all yes. but dissertation. And I had a friend who hadn't done it yet, and he said his a A B D all A B A B D all but all participation. So he was almost he was almost there. So thank you, the DRC, for being with us. And let's go sure. to Sean and talk to her. Uh, talk to Sean. Hi, Sean. Hi, Dal. How's everybody? This has been amazing. Uh, I'm I'm sorry that we're having a little bit of tech issues. Your Wi-Fi. We may have a a. a a little, you're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, Sean. I'm I'm sorry. It's might, it might be the Wi-Fi. Uh, one thing you could do is um, okay. Go ahead now. Try please. Go ahead. Okay, I was saying, you know, with overlooked, what I think about is so much how marginalized marginalized groups. We really need to support each other. Um, and you'll, uh, I mean, actually, with the ADA, a lot of the support that Judy Human and the people who began the disability rights movement, a lot of the support came from the Black Panthers and came from the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and so I just think it's really interesting to see really group together. We have to support each other. I'm Hello. Uh, yeah, Sean. So, so thank you. Uh, we, we were having a little I bit of trouble here, but tell us, yeah, tell us about your work and well, what what are the kinds of things you work on? You call yourself a disability, a beauty and disabilities advocate. Tell us what that means. That's right, because uh, I really started this this journey. I was not a born advocate like Anastasia. I, I went to elementary school with Anastasia, by the way, and I think UCP as well for preschool. Um, and her parents and and her sister, they were always entrenched in this work. I, I was a little bit of a latecomer or a late bloomer, so to speak, uh, really, because I thought that the best advocacy I could do was live my life as happily as possible. I, I believe cerebral palsy is the blessing of my life so far. Um, but, you know, I really, I always thought of myself as Sean first. So, you know, Elementary school. Street from this again. Yeah. Um, is this I, better? 
Yeah, so suddenly it's better. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so so I went to PS6 for kindergarten, and I wasn't legally allowed to go to the second floor um, because, um, you know, there were no elevators and ramps at that time yet. They were still catching up to the ADA regulations. And um, so I was there for one year. I had two boyfriends. I had the best teachers you could possibly imagine, and yet I had to leave. Um, and it actually ended up working out okay because I ended up going to PS234 where I got to be with Anastasia and Alba. And I still have my first, second and third grade and fourth grade best friends from 234. But the only reason that that big shift happened was that the, the school was not built for me at that time. So I loved PS6 and it was only across the street. So five minute commute, can't beat that. Um, but, um, but yeah, so it's amazing to me looking back how one big thing could change the course of somebody's life. And I want to say I went to PS6 long before the ADA. Uh, I lived on 89th Street and Madison Avenue. <laughs> and that's how small the world is. I'm just learning. Sean, we'll talk after about PS6. I was uh, going to say, I knew I liked you. <laughs> PS6 is also where Chevy Chase went to school and Ken, uh, Lenny Kravitz and uh, other interesting fo uh, folks yeah. went there as well. Her Twitter handle is sean for beauty 83 So please find her. Yeah. yeah. And and also, I liked you You put in, you're the first person who have had 250 plus guests on the show. You're the first to put in emojis in your stream yard uh, name. So that's good. Tell us what those emojis are. Well, I walk with two ski poles. You can't tell because I'm seated at the moment, but I have them here. I hope you can. They're iridescent ski poles, and um, I, you know, I, I call it stick power. So I like to represent them, whether via emoji or, you know, obviously since we're virtual, at least they could represent virtually in this way. But uh, yeah, I mean, I they're my partners in crime. You know, I call them Lucy and Ricky, and um, honestly, they help me traverse the world and meet people from all over the world, starts conversations. People want to know what, what are they? And, um, you know, between my unique name and, and two ski poles, uh, it certainly makes you unforgettable. It's part of why I always thought of my disability as a blessing. Thank you, Sean. I, Let's do it. Sorry, go ahead. And why all the new world. Uh, let's go now to Anastasia and hear her story. Um, hi. Um, thank you again so much for having me. Like um, Sean said, we have been lifelong friends, and um, my family and I um, have been in this fight for equality and inclusion um, since before we were born, honestly. My um, I am the advocate that I am today, largely um, due to my mother and some of the um, advocates that I caught really in my eyes that, that began this movement, like Judy Human and Ed Roberts on the uh, West Coast and many, many other giants that uh, thanks to them, I get to live uh, the life that I do. Sean and I are the same age, so I was only uh, six years old when the ADA became law, and uh, as everybody has already said, it is because of that law that I've been able to live uh, the life that I have, um, but we've all also mentioned that uh, there is a long way to go to make it more than um, I think people think of the ADA and rest on their laurels when they realize that they're meeting the minimum requirements of the law. And I think that's the challenge for the next 30 years and the, and the future beyond that is to look into ways that we can move beyond its minimum requirements and honestly get everybody um, disabled, not disabled, from every walk of life, every person to be involved in the fight. Like Sean said, um, people with disabilities were aided by the Black Panthers movement and all 
all of the movements that are going on today, Black Lives Matter and uh, the LGBTQ plus community, we all need to band together and support each other if we want to really truly live the vision of equality and inclusion that we all deserve to live, no matter what we look like or how we move around the world. And as Sean was saying, I learned that at a very young age because my disability was so visible. So I just became an advocate because I had to. I often say that I didn't choose advocacy. Advocacy chose me because I was born into it. And I think we need to support folks who have invisible disabilities. If we, if we talk about where we need to do better, I think we need to be more supportive of people whose disabilities you can't necessarily see so easily as, as one example of ways that we can do better. Um, Thank you, Anastasia. Folks, we have so many comments coming in. I'm hoping our three speakers will stay with us for a few more minutes so that we can reflect on the comments and also ask them some more questions. Let's see, Jonathan Borstein is with us. He's been watching from Union Square. He has been with us every single day since we started this show, uh, 141 episodes. And in fact, he's going to be here tomorrow on the air because this is our episode tomorrow. It is about a, a chance to meet Mayor Sean Strubb, who's an AIDS activist, mayor of Milford, Pennsylvania. And he was, uh, he's the author of Body Counts, memoir, a memoir of politics, sex, AIDS, and survival. He's a founder of Pause Magazine, ex executive director of the Ciro Project. And in 1990, became the first openly HIV positive candidate to run for federal office. That's at 9 p.m. tomorrow. Please join us. We'll talk about the pandemic from various angles, including what it's like to be mayor of a town under pandemic, but also talk to him about everything uh, he learned on his fight and his journey as an AIDS activist. And I know lots of folks who have fought in other uh, struggles, such as the disabilities movement, uh, have learned from the AIDS movement and 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 back and forth. That happens in all of them. We heard about the importance of uh, the Black Panthers in helping with some of the early movements in disabilities rights as well. Uh, let's look at some more folks. Uh, so many people watching. Ashok is watching from Kerala in India, and so is my mother. Hi, Amma. Love you. Thanks for uh, being here with us. Uh, uh, Sonali is tagging her friends. Everybody, please do that. Sonali says, celebrating people with disabilities here in New York City. Thank you, Sonali. And Nikhil is watching from Greenwich, Connecticut. Important topic. Glad you're covering it. Thank you. Makran said, ADA expert as an architect. This is Makran watching from Manhattan. Skateboards and wide, pa fash wide pant fashion comes from wheelchair accessibility. I did not know about the uh, wide pant fashion, but... Uh, Certainly the skateboards, I can understand that and I would love to hear more. Uh, Renee is watching, Renee, hi, and Renee. And Neil says, what a great lineup. We love seeing the ADA special edition on the New York Times read along last Sunday. He is the executive editor of the New York Times read along and we love having him on this show as well, watching from Springfield, Virginia. Uh, Renee is saying hello and Apollo is watching from Vegas. Let me ask our three guests, have any of you been to Vegas and are there any stories that you're allowed to share about being in Vegas. We'll start first with DRC. What are you allowed to tell us about Vegas, DRC? Um, let's see here. So I went when I was 24 and I thought that, that the infamous tagline that what happens in Vegas was just a joke. Spoiler alert, it's not. <laughs> um, it started off with me having dinner at Benihana and a very wealthy couple randomly deciding to pay for my whole dinner and my hotel room on their third honeymoon. It ended up with me at a strip show where I met a bunch of people who were sitting next to me who decided to all, we all piled into a super stretch Hummer limo, drinking Cristal. I got VIP bands uh, randomly from the bouncer and ended up at the cat house at the Luxor Pyramid 
And on my way in, the people then told me they were underage. <laughs> and then uh, as they went to the ATM and withdrew $20,000 in front of my face. <laughs> and it was, it was, I had to be the person to go buy liquor. We bought about 10 grand worth of liquor. So it was, um, yeah, it was truly something straight from the hangover. And I thought it was just going to be a blase night. But yeah, it's not something I'm going to ever forget. All right, you've now put these others in a great peril because they have to <laughs> out top that. So we're going to hear their story. Sean, we're going to go to you. But I want to say to DRC, why did you leave Vegas? Why did you not just move there? And you could have met I would have hung out. <laughs> OK, Sean go, uh, Sean, go ahead. So I first went to Vegas when I was 12. And I decided that 12 and 21, just switch the, <laughs> the numbers around. What's the difference, right? So I actually remember being right outside. There was like a off area right outside where the, um, you know, slots were. So my mom didn't know how to play poker. And I, my grandmother was a poker shark and taught me when I was four years old. So I was teaching her what hands to keep and screaming it from my um I had an oversized walker at the time. I mean, a um, uh, uh, stroller, and so I was actually giving her all her, um, all of her tips. But uh, technically, not gambling, but actually quite much uh, towing the line, literally. Um, oh my so God! I don't know what is going had, on here. Again, this is like an episode of. <laughs> this is just a, like a Vegas uh, show here now. Anastasia, over to you. Top that. <laughs> I uh, I definitely cannot top that because I have not yet been to Vegas myself. So what I would say is that I think what um, a lot of people do in Vegas has been mentioned by um, DRC. Uh, people need to think of the disability community in that way as well. And by that, I mean people need to think of us as full human beings so we like to have fun we do fall in love we do uh get married we do as our representative john lewis said get into good trouble and i think that's another message that we need to send is that just because we doesn't mean we can't have all the fun that people like to have in that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm glad we heard those stories. Apollo, by the way, Apollo was a guest on our Vegas show. We had a show all about Vegas under COVID. And one of the things he told us was about his journey going to India and being a black man in India and what that was like and the interactions with police and other things. Please go back and watch that episode. All our episodes, 141 of them, are on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Sweenet. And here he says, definitely mass media representations matter. And we have to remember the stigma entails sinister perceptions of those with hidden disabilities. This is an aspect of criminology that needs to be confronted as the US jails many people with mental illness, thereby criminalizing and targeting a vulnerable population. This is what they don't say about nonviolent offenders. And we're just gonna keep going here and look at all the comments coming in. And Paula says, greetings from Tallahassee, but tonight in Lake City, Florida. I'm afraid to ask you guys about other cities. We'll be here all day with all your stories. Uh, Vandana has put in a link, our producers put in a link to the New York Times ADA series. And we, uh, my mom says, very interesting conversation, darling. So her standards are not that high, as you know, she's my mother, but you guys are awesome. Vishal says, keep going. So he's giving you props. And Collier Ward says, fascinating topic and guest panelists. As a registered architect for 30 years, I've spent my career infusing ADA accessibility guidelines into all my buildings and facility designs. ADA is a good starting point for design, uh, says Collier. Thank you, Collier, that, that's, that's so important. And uh, Apollo also says the ADA has totally improved the dignity of public space in America. Let me ask DRC a question about where you stand as an advocate for um, for the for uh, for ADA issues, what more needs to be done? Do you see it as a starting point, or have we really come a long way? Can you talk about that, please? Uh, dissertational work 
a lot of my dissertational work um, is at the intersection of disability studies and critical race theory. And so usually what I tell people about the ADA is that it, it was a really good starting point, but I think that that's one of the problems. Um, people see it as window dressing. And I think that the ADA doesn't even begin to address the fundamental problem uh, which is foundational and that's ableism. And so it's like, you can try and tackle, you know, not having enough bathrooms in your restaurant all you want to, but if you don't invite people with disabilities into your restaurant, then what is the point? Um, and so, and I don't think that uh, restaurateurs and people in general have, have even reached that perception yet. And so I think that, yes, I think the bigger issue is the systemic foundational issue that the ADA was meant to address, but I don't think it started to do that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Anastasia, can I ask you, you're an international disability rights advocate. Where does America rank in disability accommodation and advocacy and the ability for those with disabilities to participate fully in life? Uh, sorry. Um, well, yes, but one of the reasons why I can now proudly say that I'm an international disability rights advocate is because I've had the privilege of um, speaking abroad and, and doing some disability related work um, in Asia and um, East Asia and other parts of the world. I think um, in some ways, uh, um, America is a leader, but I think uh, in other in other ways, we, we still have a long way to go. I think on an international, to start inter, internationally, we need to ratify the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. That would be a start. But uh, if you look at all of the issues in terms of structural ac accessibility, political participation, being seen as a full and equal human being, if we are still working on that here as we are in, in internationally and particularly in um, parts of most of the developing world, uh, you know, everyone is um, needs to go a lot further in making uh, disability seen and understood. And um, when you there are fewer opportunities to uh, see people with disabilities getting educated and getting opportunities to socialize and work as they deserve to as um, human beings. So um, there's there's a lot of work to do on the international stage. And I've been honored to be able to uh, contribute to raising that awareness in the international opportunities that, that I've had. Thank you for putting that in context. It's really important uh, for me coming as I do from India to see how people with disabilities are treated in India without the kind of rules we have here and without the ADA, I see what is missing, but I can see compared to some other countries, especially in Europe, where America is lagging behind. So this is a journey uh, for all of us and it's important to see. Kerry says, awesome, thank you. And Kerry says that currently delivering free home health care services to the senior and disabled community at ziffycare.com. I'm not familiar with the service. I don't know if any of our colleagues are. Uh, so she's, uh, Carrie says free home health care services for the disabled. Uh, Lewis says, greetings from Connecticut, helping people with dis disabilities in developing countries, walkabout foundation. Thank you, Lewis, for being here. We appreciate that. And Carrie is giving Carrie's email address ecocentury.ca, kgibson. at ecocentury. Uh, dot, um, ca, uh, and Apollo says I love the obituaries. Uh, thanks for overlooked floor. They didn't have an obit for Ida Wells, Mary Pleasant funded John Bur uh, John Brown's Harper's Ferry, Virginia, uh, touching off the Civil War. Love overlooked, and uh, so many other comments coming in. Lewis says way to go, Anastasia. Much love and love good trouble. And uh, Rose says, her words, good trouble. Mark says, I have dysgraphia, which is a form of dyslexia. And Mark has been on my show multiple times. We did an episode about what allies can do for the black community. 
and he was amazing on that show and was with us. And he says, the bias that exists against those who are disabled, whether it's severe disabilities or minor, is totally unfair. Many folks in our community don't find disability till adulthood. And Stefan says, okay, everyone, we need to get Anastasia to Vegas. I say, let's create a post-COVID, let's get Anastasia to Vegas fund. And we know DRC has to be in charge of the entertainment uh, with the gambling part handled by Sean and a uh, lot more that we will have to do. And we will talk about that afterward. And uh, uh, let's see, a lot more coming in. And Anna still watching, Anna at Annotated who brought all of us together tonight. Anna says, correct, not all people with disabilities are as boring as I am. You are not boring. You may not have stories like these people or you may not want to share those stories, but you certainly have, uh, you are not boring. Uh, Vandana says, DRC, I haven't been to Vegas yet, but when I do, I want to go with you. <laughs> you can have a business of just taking people to Vegas. That would be... <laughs> Anna says, I've been to Vegas three times and never had been that much fun. I need to hang out with DRC more often. So every, you see, we're on a roll here with this. And Kathy, <laughs> Kathy is joining from Minnesota. Love the discussion, says Kathy. Thank you, Kathy, for being here. And thank you, everybody, for being here. So many comments here. Let me ask Sean to talk about what it's like to navigate the world using your uh, ski poles, right? They're modified ski poles. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to, but I did want to respond a little bit to the future of uh, ADA, and there were some juicy questions in there that you asked. So Please, can I go, ahead. go there first? Because of course, because yeah, I think what what everyone's sort of getting at is that legislation can only take us so far. It's a cultural shift that needs to follow. Um, that can really, and I think we see it now more with um, social media because people, you know, have a platform. One tweet can travel around the world within minutes. Um, but I, I think it also, going back to that idea of allyship is, I think the next stage is, and we see this now with Black Lives Matter and um, many other, you know, the LGBTQ plus community um, that, you know, movement doesn't happen without everyone involved. Um, so I think that it's, it, we have a lot of work to do, but I think I'm very hopeful that people are getting these messages and people and the times and, and there's so much culturally that is shifting in the right direction. And I think we just need to keep pushing that. And I, I think internationally, the question that you asked really made me think, because I think in terms of culture, maybe we've been, you know, America, I, I always say to my friends who are advocates that you know it's really key to realize that to have the voice that we have to have the ability to speak up and um is a gift that not every country gives people with disabilities so i'm grateful for that gift um and i'm grateful for that freedom and i want to use it wisely um, and I, but I think it's interesting. Uh, otherwise, like Japan, for example, I think is way ahead in terms of assistive technology. So culturally, I don't think they're where we are because there are no legal imperatives. And um, I do think there is obviously a respect for elders and things like that. But I, um, but so it's interesting how maybe one area we could be moving forward and and still. You know, there's always more work to be done, um, but I'm inspired by the work that's been done these 30 years, and I'm excited for the next 30. So now, as far as ski poles, to get to your real question, um, yeah, ah, so I I transferred from um, Walker to getting. Sorry, Sean, we're having troubles with the Wi-Fi. We'll give it another second here. Please go ahead. Um, shop. And he said, hey, do you think I actually took on this and um, pushed me up and down the slopes? Uh, they took turns pushing me up and down the slopes. And, um, and I think for me, you know, having a traditional um, sort of walking aids as in um, uh, crutches, they always seemed heavy and clunky and they felt like they were weighing me down. I didn't like having things attached to my elbows. So there was a freedom and also a little bit of swag, I gotta say, 
with the ski pole option. You know, I felt I felt a little bit like, you know, sporty. And it did, again, like I said, it starts conversations. And I find them light and inductible. And I actually w- wrapped them in uh, black satin for prom. And then I don't know if you can see on this this Twitter that you're showing right here, you can see me on a, on a stage, um, on, actually on the runway. And they, um, Nike, donated materials to wrap my skis in that are iridescent and that's why my skis are still iridescent to this day because I love that when the light shines it could be purple it could be blue um you know there's a whole spectrum of color that's coming from them so I really believe this stick power thing is real and I'm grateful for them um but yeah I hope that answers your question I know it, that it, was it, a bit it, action packed there. Yeah, I love I, I loved it. Thank you so much. I'm gonna show the Twitter web pages of Hello? both DR DRC. Um we're gonna show the web pages of both DRC and Anastasia in just a minute, but I want to read Sean's Hello? Uh, Twitter bio to all of you. Advocate Thank NYU you. instructor. Uh for the uh Forbes instructor, Forbes contributor. Hello. I'm gonna so, try to log back in. Sure, no, Sean, we can hear you. We're just showing the whole thing. Oh, she stepped away. AT&T exemplar, speaker, chocolate lover, here to celebrate human connection and how beautiful we truly are. Let's go to DRC and uh, see his page in just a second. But DRC, reflect on some of the things we've just been talking about, please. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that uh, Sean made a, uh, a really good point. Uh, as you're going to see on my page, you know, it's funny. I, th- I was thinking about, um, I had a friend who was writing a pilot for an ABC comedy. She has a disability. And she told me, she called me and she said, uh, one of the characters that I wrote is based on you. And he's uh, black, queer, and disabled. And apparently the um, NBC producer, or excuse me, ABC producers, told her that they had to cut that character because in their words, no such person ever existed. And that that she was being, that she was piling it on for dramatic effect. (laughs) And I thought that was so terrible because it's like they can't even fathom that a person might have all of these intersections at the same time and be an actual real person. So, you know, I, in my Twitter bio, you know, I, I make, uh, mentioned to the point that I am queer, I am black, I am disabled, and it, those are all marginalized identities that make life really difficult. But um, you know, I wouldn't choose in any other way. <laughs> I salute you, DRC, and your Twitter handle is Doctor Charrington because you use a wheelchair. And uh, what is what are those pictures we see in the in the background? I see a couple of other images so, there. Yeah. Yeah, so like Anastasia, um, I guess if I had thought about it, I would have said international disability advocate because I've traveled to 23 countries. Uh, I've, I did my first master's in London and my second in the States. Uh, I have six degrees currently. And so I've had the great fortune to- Time out, time uh, out, six degrees, six, six degrees in your work. It's ridiculous. Trust me, I didn't want to. It just worked out that way. I did not want to. I went to school for like two things. And it just worked out this, I'm, my PhD will be my seventh and final. <laughs> um, <laughs> there, there, there aren't any left to get, what can you get? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's one of those things that I thought maybe I was too old to be doing this, but I got you know a full ride offer from the University of Ohio, uh, the Ohio State University, which is where I'm doing my, my PhD in English. And so, yeah, I um, in the photos, as you can see, I used to, like I said, those are some pictures from when I lived in Costa Rica. Um, I was in London at the time getting my hair done. I was taking pictures with a Marilyn Monroe impersonator in California. I was actually doing a fashion show in Germany in the corner uh, for Victoria's Secret. Um, And so I've had the great fortune to just, you know, I've worked with the World Bank and Uber and Bank of America. I've, you know, but the funny part is I couldn't get a job. Like I couldn't get a regular job just selling popcorn at the movie theater, which is what I wanted to do when I was 16. And they were like, you're in a wheelchair, you can't work here. And so my first job was with NASA. I said, fine, (laughs) if you don't want me, I'll find someone who does. And so I, yeah, I worked as a PR intern. In case anybody missed it, he couldn't get a job 
uh, selling popcorn at the movie theater when he was 16. So That's he decided true. that he'll go get a job where he was accepted. And it was first at NASA. <laughs> and uh, what an incredible story. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to ask you, the RC, is the reaction of people like me is to say, that is amazing. What is the excuse of other people? Do you find that condescending a little bit when I- I'm not gonna lie, a little. Um, mainly just because it, you know it's inspiration porn and I don't know if I'm allowed to say that or not, but but that's what it is. <laughs> Too late, you said it already. <laughs> sorry, um, sorry, sure. Uh, no, you know, the, and for people who, who don't understand that terminology, basically it's, it's when you are trying to inspire someone, but the reason that you're inspired has nothing to do with something that actually is inspiring. It's more for their existence. You know, it's, oh, you got out of bed today, congratulations. Oh, you got dressed. That must be so hard. And so, you know, I think, yeah, having six degrees is worthy of admiration. Um, but me getting dressed in the morning is not. And, you know, I've had people be like, oh, you're in a full suit. Like, look at you. Look at you just having a job and going to work. And they don't know that I work for a PR firm representing President Obama. So it's just like, you know, you have no idea what you're talking about, but people make assumptions all the time and they really, <laughs> they really should not. <laughs> Since you mentioned Obama today, we should uh, note today was the funeral of John Lewis. And one of the highlights of my life was meeting John Lewis, as you can see at the Asian American Legal Defense Education Fund Gala. And, um, uh, and think of President Obama today, one of three presidents, living presidents who was there and the fourth, uh, President Carter sent a beautiful message and, um, and we will ignore the fifth uh, at, at this moment. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to Anastasia's Twitter page and have her respond to everything we've been talking about. And then we gotta get, let you folks uh, <laughs> go back to uh, your, your evenings, but let's go to Anastasia and I'll pull up your website while we're talking here, please. Go ahead. Um, just brief reactions to, what uh, DRC and Sean have been talking about. I, um, uh, again, I absolutely agree with everything that's already been said. And I've um, lived the experience, uh, a lot of what they both described. So um, thank you for helping me highlight it. And I would say that uh, in terms of where we still need to go as a person with a disability that wouldn't be able to uh, live my life without the assistance of a personal care assistant who, who helps me um, do uh, certain activities of daily living, like uh, getting out of bed, using the bathroom, showering, dressing, those vital things that most of us don't think about. Um, I think one of the differences uh, between where we are in the U.S. and where uh, some countries in, in Europe are in terms of health care. Uh, we have a long way to go in terms of equalizing uh, the access to health care uh, for people with disabilities, especially for people with severe disabilities like my twin, twin sister and I. So as an adult with a disability, one of the issues that I'm working really hard to highlight is the importance of uh, funding home and community-based services, because I think what COVID-19 has shown the rest of society that people with disabilities have known for decades is that congregate settings are not safe places for people uh, to be, and they're not places where people with disabilities need to be. So congregate settings, meeting nursing homes and group homes, that's not where any disabled or elderly person needs to be, but that's where uh, many of us unfortunately still are. And the key to changing that is funding um, home and community-based services so that people can live happy, productive lives in a self determined way and it also should not depend on what party is in power politically. People with disabilities, not only in this country but across the world, really need to be a protected class. So if they need some of these healthcare services to survive, I literally could not survive without the healthcare services. 
and that needs to be more widely understood and broadcasted. It shouldn't, our ability to work and stay healthy and stay safe should not depend on who, who is um, politically in charge and leading this nation or any other. So I think in terms of work, workforce inclusion and being able to move up the professional ladder and protecting those that need the health care uh, to live uh, needs to be a huge priority, not only for the disabled community, but we need the help of all of our non-disabled allies to enshrine these things into law. Thank you so much for making that very clear argument for that. Really important. We want to show everyone your Twitter page, International Disability Rights Advocate, Anastasia Somoza. Your website is TAS Speaks. I guess you're called TAS by your friends. Tassi Somoza is your Instagram handle, and people can find you uh, there. And you say Black Disabled Lives Matter as your uh, cover image. For those who can't easily see who the celebrity is in that photo with you, please tell us. Uh, that is my friend, um, Amy Bowler. And if you want to know a bit more about our story, I would encourage you to pick up her uh, book, uh, Yes, Please, that she um, wrote about her, her life and her experiences. And there's this chapter in Yes, Please, where she discusses how um, she and I met, and she is a wonderful ally to um, the disability community and many, many other uh, marginalized groups. So I encourage you to check that out to um, find out more about uh, our story and friendship and the advocacy that we continue to do. So, so amazing to hear that. My kids at this moment are watching uh, Parks and Rec for the very first time. They're binge watching the whole thing. They're 17 years old. They will lose their minds when I tell them that you are in her book because they, they love Amy and that's that's awesome. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, Anna says, agree, it's all about welcoming everyone to the table. We just launched this accessible New York section of iloveny.com. So everyone, please check that out. She's, I'm no Amy Padnani though and uh, lots of other comments coming. Chitachi is here and says, this was great. And Chitachi was on my show on July 4th. What, it's, what it means to be an American, as an African-American, her thoughts, absolutely riveting. Please go back in my archives to find that. And my mom is still watching. Amma, I wanna say she's been an advocate for the disabled her entire life. And she has built multiple charity organizations in Kenya, in Washington, in India, in New York that have supported disabled folks and I'm very grateful to her. Um, so many more comments coming in. Lewis says, uh, so proud of you, Anastasia. Agree with all your points. Carrie says, elder care, intimate part partner violence, child abuse, trafficking. These are all things we need to uh, talk about. Apollo says, yes, Anastasia, people with disabilities should be a protected class. Kathy says, please remind everyone to vote. We absolutely do on this show and we want everybody to vote. Lewis says, right on. And um, Anna says, our health insurance system is awful. I had to pay 100% of my scooter out of pocket because United Healthcare decided I don't weigh enough to qualify for it. I'm not joking. These are the kinds of things we hear about all the time. And by the way, I'm going to make a commitment to, the, to all of you that I want to do more episodes on these issues and not, you know, it, it, we didn't really mean to get six people on this one show. You all said yes when we asked at short, short notice, so we're grateful to you but I want to make sure that this is not a one-time thing. We will redo, we'll, re, we'll, do, we'll visit this topic again. And if any of you who are watching who want to come on the show and talk about uh, issues around disabilities, we are here and we welcome that. Please email me at any time. Mark says, all three of you are amazing. I'll be reaching out to you folks. I want to share your story on my streaming podcast as well. I was just on a show. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's great. The RC has six degrees, says Rose. When he gets his PhD, he'll have seven degrees. Uh, everyone's <laughs> reacting to this. I love your Twitter handle and the way you handle, the way you describe yourself. And that's uh, Dr. Charrington, at Dr. Charrington, which I, um, uh, Amy's still here. And Amy says, Anna, I was there too just before COVID and Japan. I guess they're talking about their trip to Japan, uh, where they went. 
and lots of people saying they're going to go to Vegas with uh, a DRC. So uh, there's a big uh, trip. Uh, maybe we'll all go and uh, we'll get there and uh, uh, once everything is okay. But we need to let you all get uh, get going. I'm going to give you each a chance to give us a final uh, thought before you go. Let's start with Sean Horn. Please go ahead, Sean. Sean, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. What did you What did you just ask us? To do? No, so your your final thoughts, please. Can you your your final? Oh, thoughts. just yeah. well. First of all, I think. Uh, yeah, I I think the most important thing is to realize that being a part of podcasts like this and being interested in asking questions that's all a part of allyship. I think there's a lot of people that assume that you have to have a PhD, like. Darcy, or that you have to have a list in order to have the compassion solutions necessary. You know, if you're a technologist, you can be a part of the solution. If you have a heart, you can be a part of the solution. And I just want to thank you guys, anyone present for being here, because that is allyship. And um, and I do think, yes, it goes beyond just ADA. ADA is wonderful once a year to celebrate, but this is an everyday thing. Um, and this is something that I think you know, all of us who have lived experiences know that this doesn't end here. So I'm just going to say to be continued. And thank you so much, Sri, for having us. Uh, and I promise to have ironclad Wi-Fi for the next visit. Thank you. We're just so grateful to you. Everyone, please follow her. She's on Twitter. Sean for Beauty 83 is her Twitter handle. And please uh, connect with her. Thank you very much, Sean. Let's go to Anastasia. I want to echo what one of my best friends, Sean, said. Um, the the movement for us, for Sean, DRC, and everyone we've heard from tonight, as well as um, millions of of others around the country. We it's not about a day or even a month. It's it's our lived experience. We don't get to uh, check in for a little while and and then. Uh, to now, this is these are the things that we experience every day, and the only way to to move the needle and equalize our lived experience is to is to make sure that um, we invite everyone into the movement and that we um, don't criticize people who want to join for making mistakes or maybe temporarily not representing every person that is a part of that movement. Uh, we need to move a little bit beyond focusing on preferred language. And it's important to be educated and to think about those things. But uh, we all can't represent everyone at every single moment. So we need to recognize that all of us, even those of us who are advocates, have a continued learning process that we need to go through and we just need to be as supportive as possible to as many people as we can all the time and and be forgiving and understanding of those that are going to go through a learning process to um, become stronger and better allies to the disability community here in the U.S. and abroad. Thank you. And a special shout out to you because I'm the parent of twins. So you are a twin and you have a twin sister. So uh, th those are my twins that I'm going to be telling about the Amy Poehler connection that you have. Uh, let's go now to DRC. And please follow Anastasia Somoza on Twitter. And you heard her Instagram is also Tessie Speaks is her Instagram handle. All right, let's go to DRC, please. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to need somebody from Netflix to come hit me up because I think that both I and Sean would make an amazing kind of, of series about our just Vegas shenanigans and my life in general, shenanigans, <laughs> dating a former uh, Olympic swimmer in London and all of the, non the nonsense that I had to deal with. Um, but, but realistically, um, <laughs> I think that the biggest thing that people should get out of this is that um, I don't see why people think that uh, once they reach a certain age, that, that their life is over. I think that that is the unexpected um, negative that comes out of constantly repeating a narrative about disability, that it is broken and disgusting and, and that your life is done, which 
the media perpetuates. Because what happens is people get older and they just think that there's nothing to do with their lives. Child, we've been living in this life since day one. <laughs> and I can tell you that I have stories that will put your novel to shame. And so the reality is that those stories should be told. People like myself should be all over the place. They should be all on TV, all in movies. And you know, it shouldn't be a shock when people hear about the things that I'm doing or the things that Sean or uh, you know Anastasia is doing because this is real life. And so I would hope that at the end of the day, the more that people recognize that we live full lives as full human beings, that you too, when you get older and you can't hear as well or you can't move as well or see quite as good, that you know, you have technology. You can switch to uh, audible narration. You can still go to the movies and enjoy you some Marvel films on audio. You know, there are things you can do with your life, and your life is not over. And people with disabilities really are uh, models for adaptation and just you know basic blueprints on how to live your best life, no matter what condition or what kind of body you have. Salute you, sir. Uh, you, did you say? Tree, tree. Yes, please go ahead. Can I just go add ahead, one please. thing before we go? Please. please go ahead. Because I want to make sure people know. I think everyone here believes absolutely that their disability adds to their life. I believe that disability makes my life richer, and I want to put that out there because I'm not so interested in what culture says about me. I'm interested in the culture that I can create, that I I can make and shift and shape the world. Because if we go by how the world looks at race, if we go by the way the world looks at women, at disability, all of those things get weighed down. And I think it's so important in this time to be creators of who want to be seen and not so much feed into whatever's been said before. I think that's what the next 30 years will be and how we will define ourselves as a generation and as a human race. So I, I, I did, I mean, I just wanted to add that because I, you know, we don't have to buy into it. We don't have to buy into any kind of negativity. We can make a choice in life and I'm so blessed to have my disability. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Sean. And I want to make sure I, I got Darcy's uh, comment because that deserves to be on a t-shirt. Did you, what did you say about your life and my novel? What did you say? How did you put I, it? I just said the things that I have done in my life will put your novel to shame. And it's the 100% truth. <laughs> uh, all, we have hundreds of journalists who watch Ooh. our show. Uh, uh, connect with Dar Darcy and tell him. Tell I mean, him. the reality is I've been trying to become, a, like people have told me for years, you need to become a motivational speaker. I have no idea how to do that. Um, <laughs> people keep being like, how did you do that? Like your life is insane. Yes, it is. Well, but... it, starts, it starts today because I know people are gonna follow up and people are gonna connect with you at Dr. Charrington. We are so grateful to both of you. One of the things we'll do now, we'll, we'll let you both go. But one of the things I want to just remind everybody about our show tomorrow, uh, we're very excited to uh, bring you a conversation about the AIDS fight. Um, and we have a very important show with uh, Mayor Sean Strubb will be here, AIDS activist, the mayor of Milford, Pennsylvania, and the founder of Pause Magazine, and the first openly HIV positive candidate to run for federal office. And Jonathan Borstein will help me tell the story of Sean Strubb tomorrow, 9 p.m. And uh, we always, we talk to um, Kimberly Crenshaw, the-, uh, the Oh, I love her. The, she's amazing. And I asked her, uh, what can uh, folks do to be allies of, of, of African-Americans? And she said, say their names and say her name. So I'm gonna do that in just a minute, but I wanna say thank you to Dr. Charrington, at Dr. Charrington. He's still getting his PhD, his seventh degree. And Anastasia Somoza, who's with us, a twin and a disability rights advocate, internationally speaker, consultant. Please connect with all of these folks. We're so grateful to them for their time. And I make a promise that this show, as long as it's on, is always open to talking about these issues. And we want you and others to come back and please recommend us for anybody who's working on these things, on these topics. We had some great comments. Uh, Kathy said, this is a great show. Jonathan says, great show. And uh, and Kathy says, thankful together. 
coalition stronger together, says Lewis. Kathy says, thankful for this show. Allies are incredibly important, says Anna, who got us all together, all in one day. Uh, uh, um, and uh, Carrie says, amazing. DRC, I want to write my next project about you. Keep it coming, she said. <laughs> and so many loved it. Uh, folks, everybody's watching. Please tag your friends. Tell them to watch this show. You have friends around the world who would benefit from this. When when uh, DRC says he's going to be a motivational speaker, some people might think it's motivational to people with disabilities, yes, but also just everyone else about the importance of thinking about the whole picture as he is, and we're so grateful. And Amy says, love Taz, and, uh, and uh, Apollo says, awesome experience. Thank you all. So let me let you go and say thank you very much to Anastasia, thank you. Sean, thank you. And, uh, and to uh, DRC. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. And thank you all for watching. One of the things we're going to do now is to say their names as we do on this show every night. So let me bring up our, uh, the, no the way we used to do it, let me explain for those who haven't been here is we used to use the Titus Kaffer cover of uh, Time Magazine, stunning uh, painting by Titus of a uh, mother with her child taken away. And then on the right, you see a photograph of a young George Floyd with his mother, Larcinia, who would die two years before he would be killed, almost to the day. And now they're buried together in Houston. He, of course, was killed in Minneapolis. Our, a lot of our colleagues who are watching uh, said to us that we should uh, go to the Say Her Name report, and that's what we're using tonight. Brianna Taylor, killed by police in her bed on March 13th. And now I'm going to read all these names. And as I do, I want to ask you a question. Have you heard of all of these women? Do you know their stories? I bet you the answer is no. And that's part of the problem. I'm going to now read the names. Brianna Taylor, Atatiana Jefferson, Charlena Siobhan Lyles, Corin Gaines, India Kager, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Michelle Cousseau, Pearly Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith. As I read the second column, how many names do you know? Renisha McBride, Miriam Carey, Kayam Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelley Fry, Melissa Williams, Shulena Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Cherise Francis, Aliana Stanley Jones, Tarika Wilson, Katherine Johnston, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Don Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, and Eleanor Bumpers. How many names do you know? How many stories can you tell? How many stories have we heard? That's one of the reasons why Kimberly Crenshaw asked us to say their names, and that's what we're doing right now. Thank you all for being here with us. Thank you for supporting this show by watching, by sharing, by tagging, by suggesting speakers. We've had more than 250 speakers, and we're so grateful to each of them for coming on this show. Thank you to our sponsors again, a reminder of our sponsors for today. Our sponsors include Muckrack Academy, the Fundamentals of Social Media course, mrac.co slash social. It's free, it's a certificate, and 4,000 people have signed up, and so can you, mrac.co slash social. We also want to thank our sponsors at Nunbelievable, Divinely Delicious Cookies on a Mission. Each box of handcrafted cookies provides two meals to those in need. 20% off with the code SREE. -E. Please check it out. SREE -E for nunbelievable.com, Divinely Delicious Cookies on a Mission. And we want to thank all of you for being here, for supporting the show. Big thanks to our two producers, Rose Horowitz and Vandana Menon, and to Scroll.in, incredible support from them for 
simulcasting us on their channels. Anybody who's watching, anyone that I can help, please email me, sri at sri.net. Please follow me on Twitter, sri. Instagram is sri.net. And we would love to connect with you and learn from you, collaborate with you. If you have a project idea, please get in touch. I would be very grateful. And with that, we'll say good night. We'll see you tomorrow on another, another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show.